Hello everyone and welcome. This uh, is Introduction to Economics. This is the first video in this lecture series. And in this video, we'll be talking about the basics of which we'll be dealing with the life of the economist and their contribution to the field of economics. Now, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell so that you'll be notified when we'll be uploading videos like this. Now, we will start with economics as uh, defined. Now, the word economy comes from the Greek word oikonomos, which means the one who manage a household. Now, a household and the economy may have very much in common. What are those? Both have to produce and allocate resources. The household in itself is more or less the same as the economy. They have limited resources that have to be allocated in a specific period of time. And so that's the reason why the word economy, which means the one who manages a household or managing a household, is used to explain or to define or to provide a, a terminology, that's the right term, on the concept of managing a country as a whole. Now that's a basic concept of economics. Now, why is it that we have to manage resources? Well, that's a very simple question. That is because of scarcity. Now what is scarcity? Scarcity refers to a basic economic problem, the gap between limited resources and the theoretically limitless wants. This situation requires people to make decisions about how to allocate resources efficiently in order to satisfy the basic needs as many additional ones as possible. By the way, if you are looking at your screen, there are QR codes that are displayed in each slide that we're using in this very presentation. And when you see a QR code, it means that we are quoting an authority somewhere else. So if you want to know deeper into this concept that we are talking about right now, you can scan on that QR code and you will be redirected to a website by which we took this particular information. Now, scarcity simply means that the resources in the entire globe is limited. And because there is a limit in all the resources that we can dispense, in all of the decisions that we do, in order to meet the needs and the wants in a specific uh, period of time, the idea there is we have to intelligently allocate those resources because, again, it is limited. So you have to specify which are those important aspects of the economy that have to be prioritized in a sense that uh, it uh, will not degrade the resources or the limited resources because we have to conduct ourselves in the sense of what we call as intergenerational responsibility. Now, economic is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. In most societies, resources are allocated not by an old powerful dictator but through the combined choices of millions of households and firms. Economists also study how people interact with one another. Now, economics can be generally broken down into macroeconomics, which concentrates on the behavior of the economy as a whole, and microeconomics, which focuses on individual people and businesses. Now, the formal study of economics only began somewhere in the 1700s, most especially in the publication of the book entitled An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations by philosopher Adam Smith. Other prominent economists include, but not limited to, John Stuart Mill, Thomas Robert Malthus, David Ricardo, and the like. And here are my discussion on the life and contribution of these following economists. Now, who are the people behind economics? We begin with Adam Smith, 
to popularize the free enterprise theory when he wrote the book entitled The Wealth of Nations in 1776. He is considered the father of economics. He developed a number of theories about market that we regard as a standard theory now. He is Scottish, graduated from Glasgow, and at the age of 17, he became a lecturer in Scotland. He is often recognized by the expression the invisible hand, which he used to demonstrate how self-interest guides the most efficient use of resources or the nation's economy with public welfare coming as a byproduct. Now, what did Alan Smith provided and uh, introduced to us is the idea that government should be limited in the interaction of businesses and businessmen in a market setting, meaning that the government should not interfere in the natural conditions of trade and commerce because the moment the government tried to interfere into the business sector, it collapses. And every time we observe that this one is a reality by looking at the historical data from the time he actually propounded this particular theory. And so Adam Smith is regarded to be the brightest mind in the field of economics by providing us the idea that as much as possible, the government should be limited in terms of business. Next, we have Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus uh, is an English economist and demographer who is best known for his theory that population growth will always tend to outrun the food supply and that betterment of humankind is impossible without turn or stern limits on reproduction. This thinking is commonly, commonly referred as Malthusianism. Now, Thomas Malthus, the principles and ideas, the thinking called Malthusianism is the primary reason why we have birth controls in our country. Birth control that uh, seeks to limit the growth of population because according to Thomas Malthus, there will be shortage of food in the next few decades and centuries. This is because population will outrun the food supply. Then we have David Ricardo. Uh, David Ricardo is an English economist who gave a systematized classical form of uh, classical form to the rising science of economics in the 19th century. His laissez faire doctrine were typified as his iron law of wages, which states that all attempts to improve the real income of workers were futile and that the wages per force would remain near subsistence level. Laissez faire, or in French, allow to do, is a policy of minimum governmental interference in the economic affairs of individuals and society. This is somewhat kind of a connection to the idea of Adam Smith, which provided that the government should have limited interference on the economic affairs of individual people and the society in general. His idea provided that there should be a limited form of government and let the private sector control, or control how the economy works. And in some of the free market economies, this uh, proves to be a good idea because much of the free market economy in the world actually prospered well. Then we have John Baptiste Say, a French classical and liberal economist in, and scholar, and uh, was born in Lyon in, uh, in 1767 and had a distinguished career. He served on a government finance committee under Napoleon, taught political economy in France, and the Athenee, the Conservator National de Art et Metters, and later the College de France, 
where he was named as its chair of political economy. Says law of markets is a classical economic theory that says that production is the source of demand. According to Say's law, the ability to demand something is financed by supplying a different good, which means that we demand when there is availability of something that we have to demand of. Like let's say for example, who would want a cell phone in 1980 when there's no cell phone in the first place? And so product have to be produced in order to induce some kind of a demand. That is how John Baptist say is um, interpreting economics in his, his specific and individual perspective. Then we have Irving Fisher. He's an American economist best known for his work in the field of capital theory. He also contributed to the development of modern monetary theory. His modern monetary theory discusses the relationship between money and what it will buy has always been the, the central issue of monetary theory. Crucial to the understanding of this matter is the distinction economist makes between the, the face or the nominal values and the real values. That is, between official values stated in the current dollar, pesos, or pounds, yen, euros, and so on, and the same quantities adjusted by the price level. The latter is a real value, meaning the real quantity of goods and services, and assets that money will buy. Now, what does it really mean? Well, as it, is, it is as simple as this. Your money doesn't have a value. Why? Because your money is a piece of paper written with the numerical units. It doesn't really have any value at all. You can't even eat it. You can't use it without a corresponding product, goods and, goods and services. Which means that the, the nominal value of your money doesn't represent anything. It is a mere face value or the nominal value of a particular thing. But the moment you purchase that one into something that is tangible, something that can be used, then it becomes the real value of your money, which is numbered in a particular scale. Let's say one peso, two peso, one dollar, two dollars. When you purchase a piece of a burger, it becomes a real value of the nominal value of your money, which means that the value of your money depends on how expensive the product is. So when the product becomes expensive, the value of your money reduces. Let's say, for example, um, in 1990, you can actually buy one kilogram of rice for only around 10, 15 pesos. So if you have 15 pesos in 1990, you can buy one kilogram of rice. But in 2020, your 15 peso could no longer buy the same, uh, the same goods in 1990, which is one kilogram of rice. Why is that? Because the real value of a particular product increases as time goes by. It's called inflation. And when inflation attacks a particular society, it increases the value of goods and services, which in turn reduces the value of your money because you can no longer buy one kilogram of rice for 15 pesos today in 2021. That is the monetary concept provided by Irving Fisher in our own individual realm. But of course, he also provided the idea of, of money in the context of the macroeconomic level where the countries produces money only 
in comparison to the capacity to, to, to produce goods and services of a particular country or what we call as the gross domestic product. It's a quite uh, complex idea, but nevertheless, he has provided us a good glimpse on how money works and its values rise and fall in an economic scenario, on an economic situation. Then we have John Keynes or John Maynard Keynes. He is an English economist and journalist, a financier best known for his economic theories that Keynesian economics on the causes of prolonged unemployment. His most important work is the, is the general theory of employment, interest, and money. Advocated a remedy for economic recession based on the government-sponsored policy of full employment. The general theory of employment, interest, and money was published around 1935 to 1936. In other words, intended to provide a theoretical basis for government full employment policies. It was a dominant school of macroeconomics and represented a prevailing approach to economic policy among Western government until 1970s. While some economists argue that full employment can be restored if wages are allowed to fall to lower levels, Keynesians maintain that businesses will not employ workers to produce goods that cannot be sold because they believe unemployment results from insufficient demand of goods and services. Keynesianism is considered as a demand side theory that focuses on short-run economic fluctuation. John Maynard Keynes actually provided a theory or an idea that government should should at some point, employ everyone. So the government will provide the wages and salaries in order that the problem of unemployment will be solved. And that according to him, those that are employed by the government should present or should create goods that are highly demanded. That they should not be... Uh, developing and creating goods that are that have no demand at all because that at some point will affect the profitability of the company or the institution which would result into unemployment when the products are not sold in the market then we have the different criteria for economic outcomes now you can evaluate by mere looking at an economy whether or not it's prosperous or whether or not it's uh, at some point failing. Now, there are four criteria for judging economic outcomes. Number one is efficiency. Produce what people want at, at, least, at the least possible cost. Efficiency. Uh, is our country efficient? Efficient? Efficient ba atong country? I do not know. Why? Because we do not produce products at the least possible cost. Equity. Most promote fairness and equality. The problem is what we think is fairness from person to person. Meaning our the resources equally divided from person to person. Here is there a balance between how persons actually receive something out of what it has provided in the economy? Because at some point, some actually receive more but work less. And some work more but receive less. Then we have growth should spur an increase in total output of the economy or the industry. Are we growing as a country? The gross domestic product is increasing, but, but is it enough to make us believe that this, that this particular growth is 
is stable. And then we have stability. Is a country or an industry, economy is doing well? People have jobs. They're buying products. And the economy is healthy. That is stability. Is the economy stable? Is it not fluctuating or affected too easily by several forces of nature and some other issues that could uh, potentially uh, affect the economic performance of a particular country just like let's say for example when the philippines was hit by typhoon yolanda typhoon haiyan we were struggling so hard in order for us to uh, develop but in comparison to japan when they were struck by a tsunami they were able to recover recover very well and fast light, lightning speed of recovery so it means that the japanese economy is more stable than us in the philippines and so that is it it's a fact that we have to accept 